Hello and welcome to this Nordic Tech Webinar on the best practices for cellular IoT development. My name is Björn Kvåle. I'm your host today. I'm a product marketing engineer at Nordic Semiconductor. Uh, just a few quick words about me. So I started off as a tech support engineer in the uh, tech support group at Nordic, where I mainly focused on Bluetooth, mesh, and cellular IoT. And then I moved over to uh, product marketing. Uh, just some quick practicalities before we get started. So the duration of this webinar will be approximately 60 minutes. So that's 45 minutes for a presentation and then roughly 15 minute Q&A. Um, questions are encouraged. Uh, please type the questions in the top of the right sidebar. So you should see this, ask a question box. So just type your questions there. All the questions are anonymous. Um, try to keep them relevant to the topic at hand, and we will answer towards the end in the uh, Q&A session. The chat is not anonymous and should not be used for questions. So you should see that on the bottom right of the screen. If you have any more questions after the webinar is over, um, feel free to go to Nordic DevZone. That's devzone.nordicsemi.com. And the recording of the webinar together with the presentation will be available at webinars.nordicsemi.com slash on dash demand. Uh, you can also just go to webinars.nordicsemi.com and you'll easily find the on-demand section there. So this uh, it should, should go out, the recording should go out uh, beginning next week. Agenda. So basically what I'll be doing, I'll be going through the first half of the best practices for cellular IoT development white paper. Um, so I'll be going through chapters one to six, and then also chapter 12. Um, the reason why I'm including chapter 12 is that antenna design is super important in order to get good performance and also to be able to, you know, really opt, we'll use the NRF 9160 SIP, uh, to its optimum. We may do a part two of this webinar but uh, this has not been uh, decided yet. If you want to check out chapters seven and 11, um, if you want to learn more about those chapters, feel free to go to the best practices uh, white paper. So moving right on in to the hardware architecture. So this is based on the NRF 9160 SIP is based on a Nordic uh, dual core SOC. So we do have an ARM Cortex-M33 processor for the application. You can see it here on the figure, this white box here. We do have one megabyte of flash with cache and 256 uh, kilobytes of RAM. Um, we have a multiband LTM narrowband IoT modem with GNSS, so that's over here. And by GNSS, we support uh, GPS and QZSS as of right now. We do have a very small form factor. So we have included the PMIC, RF front end, passives and crystals. And you can see those here on the side here and also on the right hand side uh, here. And the great thing about this design is that it does, the integrated design does simplify uh, total hardware complexity quite a bit. So all you really need to add is a battery, uh, one or multiple sensors, a SIM card, an LTE antenna, and if you want to use uh, GNSS, you know, a GNSS antenna. We do have multiband support for uh, global coverage. More information on our website about that. And we are pre-certified. It is a pre-certified system and package. And again, more information on our website about that. And by, you know, multiband support for global coverage, I just say one thing about, uh, so I, I'd say one of the goals of Nordic is to be able to, you know, have an, let's say an asset tracker that works worldwide, like truly worldwide and uh, where you can use one uh, SIP. Now that was, that was sort of one of the, one of the use cases for this uh, NRF 9160 SIP. Um, 
we do also have one of the good things about having this, you know, integrated design where you have both the application processor and the modem um, in the same SIP is that you can get better technical support because the entire module is provided by one vendor. Um, so you won't, if let's say you have an application processor from one vendor and a modem from another vendor, and they start pointing their fingers at each other, um, yeah, you won't you won't get that at us uh, with us, be seeing as we provide both of it. Also, we do have the Nordic uh, DevZone support portal, and there is a link here. And the great thing about the uh, Nordic DevZone is, you know, we do have you know fifty plus engineers working there full time manning the portals, um, and they do truly know. Uh, what they're talking about. Uh, they have very good uh, technical depth and yeah, provide very great answers. Um, I was just at Embedded World last week and you know a lot of customers came up to me and said, we really love Nordic uh, DevZone. They've really helped us out a lot. So that is, that's one of the key takeaways and I'll talk about this a bit later too. You know, use the Nordic DevZone. You can use the NRF9160 system and package in a single chip implementation, or you can also use it as a serial modem. So we do have a serial LT modem application where you can essentially use the whole entire SIP as a modem just by sending AT commands. So that can be useful if you, you know, quickly want to transition from a 2G or 3G application to LTM narrowband LT. And let's say later on, you transition to just using the NRF9160 SIP. That's a possibility. Moving on to chapter three. So this chapter focuses on low power app design through uh, radio focus. Um, so depending on whether you choose LTM or narrowband IoT, also the transport uh, protocol. So that would be, let's say UDP TCP and the application protocol, um, the data transfer frequency, so how often you're sending data, and the payload size, how many bytes you're sending. All of those factors influences uh, power consumption. And one thing to note is that in cellular, there, there is an overhead for each cloud connection. So right, you need to, you need to start the modem, uh, you need to connect uh, to the network, you might have you know, application protocol headers, you might have transport headers, uh, security, et cetera. So everything you are, you are adding overhead for each uh, cloud connection. And basically what I wanna showcase here is the online power profiler. We can see an image on the right hand side. And I think what I'll do is I'll actually quickly show you the online power profiler. So if we just go here, so here's the online power profiler. I'll just quickly show you how to get there. So we do, if you go to devzone.nordicsemi.com, and then if you go click here to try it out, then you can see the online power profiler. We have one for NRF52 and NRF53 series too, but for right now, we're just gonna focus on the NRF91 series. Um, if you want to you know, check out a user guide for how to use it, you can find that here under user guide. If I just click on this, what we can see is uh, different settings on the right hand side. Um, we can see some information here on the current consumption. Um, here you can actually import export settings. You can also export a project configuration. So if you want to set these settings, you can export a project configuration to uh, NRF Connect for VS Code as a config file, for example. Um, so that is all uh, possible here. Um, so what I'll actually do now, I'll leave this be. So using Rev2 LTM uh, power saving mode, this is a uh, essentially a yeah, power saving feature. Uh, we'll turn off, we'll leave that on. We'll set the periodic tau to uh, one hour. Um, RC idle mode, we'll disable that. Data transfer, we will say upload and we'll upload 100 bytes. And the network parameters will keep that 
the same and GPS will be disabled. So here we can actually see, if we go down to the graph, this is the same graph that I'm showing uh, here. And basically what I wanna showcase here is that, so here, so this is the overhead here, this one, this one, this one, and this one. All of those four rectangles are overhead. So first, you know, you have the network sink that uh, has a charge of 1.244 microcoulombs, uh, sorry, millicoulombs. Um, so the charge is essentially just the area of that box. Um, then you have a sim sink, then you have a RC setup, and last but not least, you have a tau too. And this, this is first where you're actually uploading the 100 bytes, right? So you can see if we look at the charge, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that, you know, this area is a lot smaller than the total sum of this area. So essentially the value you're getting, the data upload area is a lot smaller than the overhead area here. So let's move back here. And as you can see, this is what I'm trying to showcase here. Um, but there are some ways to, to solve this. And what I'm trying to showcase is, you know, you have to really value the data you send versus the cost of sending it. And by cost here, we're, we're essentially talking about the overhead. So the charge, the power consumption, the, the drainage on your battery, essentially. Um, but it could also be, you know, the cost of sending the data, right? Um, but for right now, we'll just look at power consumption. And here we can actually see, so the difference between this one and this one is here we're actually just sending a thousand bytes instead of sending a hundred bytes. So we're showcasing a bit uh, this bulk transfer, which I'll talk about. So in order to essentially minimize um, or maximize the value per cost, uh, some of the ways you can do this is, you know, do as much local processing on the NRF 9160 system and package as you can. Only transfer the important information to the cloud. So any, if, if there's, you know, any way of either doing some kind of local processing or using AI or machine learning to minimize the amount of data you're sending uh, to the cloud, that is uh, perfect. And that's very useful to do. Um, and that's because, you know, every time you're sending or receiving data, you need to turn on the radio and the radio consumes energy. Bulk data transfers, like I'm trying to showcase here, is also very useful, right? So just by sending 100 versus 1,000 bytes, uh, you're essentially 10 times you're increasing the value divided by cost by 10 times, but I'll go a bit through more through that in the next slide. Um, for machine learning applications, we do have uh, Edge Impulse. It's a very good partner that we have, a solution partner, and they have really simplified machine learning for uh, Edge devices, so for uh, constrained devices such as uh, the Thingy91 and the NRF9160 DK. So great documentation on how to set up Edge Impulse with uh, Thingy91. So here we're actually, this slide, we're just gonna showcase the bulk transfer, sending a hundred bytes versus sending a thousand bytes. And like I was saying, you know, the value divided by cost is essentially the bytes sent. So in this case, a TX up to the base station, to the cloud, divided by the overhead charge. So. Like I was saying, the charge is just the area of these circles. So by sending, you know, a thousand bytes here instead of a uh, hundred bytes like we had here, what we're basically doing is we're providing 10 times the value divided by cost. Um, and that is because the overhead, so the overhead is remaining the same while um, you are 10 times you're sending 10 times the number of uh, bytes. So I'd say the key points here that we want to show is that, you know, only turn on the radio when absolutely necessary. Um, 
send the time critical data immediately and then send the deferrable data in bulk uh, transfers. Moving on to LT technology. So here we are showcasing uh, LTM versus uh, narrowband LT. So just looking at some of the similarities versus differences. Uh, LTM, it's also referred to as LTCAT M1 or also EMTC. Um, narrowband IoT is split into LTCAT NB1 and LTCAT NB2. So CAT NB1 was in the 3GPP release 13, while CAT NB2 is the 3GPP release uh, 14. On the bandwidth side, you can see a bigger bandwidth on the uh, on LTM versus uh, narrowband IoT. And essentially the wider bandwidth does then mean that you can send more uh, throughput. So you can send more data on LTM versus on narrowband IoT. As you can see, CAT NB2 is increasing the data throughput uh, more, um, which is a good thing. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that later. But in essence, we'll, we'll actually, for the remainder of this web webinar, we'll mainly focus on uh, CAT M1 versus CAT uh, NB1. So those are the two we'll be focusing on. Uh, latency. Oh yeah, and one more thing regarding the bandwidth. So there's one of the useful things about having the smaller bandwidth is that the receiver is better able to filter out noise. So that basically means that you get better receiver sensitivity on narrowband IoT versus uh, LTM. And that, that is then part of the reason why, um, and of course, big, better receive sensitivity leads to a better link budget. And that's why you have a better typical range on narrowband IoT versus uh, LTM one. Uh, the other reason actually has to do with the uh, max throughput, that you have less uh, throughput. But anyway, um, seeing as you have max throughput, uh, higher max throughput on LTM, you then also have uh, better uh, latency on LTM versus on narrowband IoT, but the latency is dependent, you know, on how many retransmissions you require, and that, you know, depends on the signal quality to the base station, so the RSRP. So it could be, let's say, in some cases, you know, where you're at the border, and we actually have a YouTube video where we've shown this, uh, in some cases, then, if, you, if you're really at the borderline to a base station, it can be more energy efficient to go with narrowband IoT. But this is very edge edge cases, so and that's, yeah, that's not really the focus, but it's, it, it's good to know. When it comes to cell reselection, um, LTM is the way to go. So by this we mean, you know, switching from one base station to another base station. So if you have more mobile applications, most likely LTM is a good, uh, good one to use. Um, for static applications, also for applications, let's say in, in bad RF environments, let's say parking sellers, et cetera, you're probably more suited to uh, narrowband IoT. Um, also roaming. So if you need to connect to multiple uh, cell networks, then LTM is the better choice. You can, you do have limited uh, roaming with narrowband IoT. And also if we go quickly back to cell reselection, you are able to do some kind of cell reselection on narrowband IoT, but you'll be using a lot more power uh, for that than you will on LTM1. A deployment density is same for both. So that's uh, 50,000 devices per cell and battery lifetime up to 12 years, that is for an app that is optimized uh, for power consumption. I'm not quite sure on the uh, specific details on that one. Moving on to peak uh, current. So if we look at this is this can be found on our product specification for the NRF 9160 system and package. So the peak current for CAT M1, this is on just looking at TX, so transmitting, sending data to the base station on max output power of 23 dBm. Uh, there we're looking at between 255 and 290 milliamps, 
uh, depending on which band is used. So this could be B3, B4, B13, or B20. Um, peak current on CAT NB1, uh, same conditions, uh, 230 to 275 milliamps. So what I'm trying to show basically is that the if we look at this image on the side, so you have the time on the x-axis, you have uh, the current on the y-axis, or max current, I guess. Um, the height of this rectangle versus this rectangle is very similar. So what we can say is that an NRF9160 base design using CAT M1 generally uses less power than CAT NB1, um, assuming good to reasonable radio conditions. Um, so that, that, that's very useful to know. And one of the main reasons for this is that is just the throughput, which I showed in the last slide. So if we look at the throughput here versus here, you can see that the throughput is between uh, roughly 6.3 and uh, 10 times uh, greater for LTM. So that means the on-air TX. So here on this graph, we're just looking at TX. We're not looking at any of the overhead or anything that I showed before. So the on-air TX, seeing as assuming you're sending the same amount of data, uh, the on-air TX will uh, be higher for uh, NB1 versus uh, CAT M1. So you're spending more time on air using more uh, power. Again, on LTA technology, this is chapter four. Um, most operators do support both CAT M1 and CAT NB1. Um, this is not the case in all countries though. Um, the NRF9160 SIP, the Sika variant is the most popular. That's the one that supports both LTM and narrowband OT and GNSS. And in general, CAT M1 is greater than CAT NB1. So it's better to use CAT M1 than CAT NB1 unless you need you know, the high penetration. So let's say you're in a parking cellar and you need better, better link budget, better range, or you don't need to send a lot of data. Um, but in, in, most, in most cases, it's a better idea to use uh, CAT M1 versus CAT NB1. On the right hand side, we can see this uh, chart here. This is taken from GSMA Mobile IoT Development uh, Map. And please, you know, refer to this one for the latest one, especially if you're watching the recording afterwards. Uh, this one gets updated quite often. Uh, you can see the countries here that support both LTM and narrowband IoT. And like I said, most of them do. You do have some exceptions, such as uh, China, India. South Africa, et cetera, that only support narrowband OT. But again, you know, operators are working on this and yeah, as, as we move along, uh, there'll be probably be more, more countries that do support both LTM and narrowband IoT. Moving on to chapter five, so the network coverage and SIM cards. Um, one important question, you know, at the beginning to ask yourself is, is your product global or regional? So, you know, regional products may be more useful to go to a local a network operator. And this is mainly because then you're most often guaranteed to have a PSM and EDRX power saving features. So if you have a battery operated product and you require these power saving features, a local SIM might be useful there. Um, you do need um, an LP, so that's a low power wide area network SIM, not a regular 2G to 4G SIM. So you can't just, you know, buy an NRF9160 DK, stick in your regular uh, SIM card uh, from your phone and expect it to work. Um, if you are deploying in multiple countries, a roaming SIM may be useful. Um, so you check out the you know, cellular connectivity partners uh, website page for more information on that and roaming sims can be used on multiple networks where contracts have been negotiated so assu assuming that one 
network, you know, can't basically satisfy all of your needs, and all of your requirements, uh, roaming sims can be very useful because they've already negotiated uh, the contracts with the network operators. Uh, local sims. Um, this is just showcasing the difference between local sims and roaming sims. Um, so to summarize, you know, local sims may only work in specific uh, regions. Uh, you can sign contracts with multiple operators, but this can be, you know, a time intensive uh, process. It is still quite sort of low, low tech. You need to sign contracts, etc. So yeah, in that case, multiple, multiple, uh, if you need multiple uh, networks, a, a roaming sim might be more useful. Um, most local sims do have EDRX and PSM features, and this is not the case for all uh, roaming sims. On the roaming sim side, you know, it might be easier to use in a global operation because of uh, being able to roam on uh, different networks. Uh, roaming sims may also not have EDRX uh, PSM features. So if you need those, especially for battery operated devices, it is very useful to have EDRX and PSM. Um, yeah, then a local SIM might be better to use. But there are some exceptions. So both Arkesa and iBasis actually do have feature, these features. So they have EDRX and PSM support. And you could, can go to these uh, relevant links to actually download a, uh, you can see there's a chart there that says which country has support for which uh, uh, EDRX or PSM uh, feature. So that is very useful to know on that. And the NRF9160DK and the Thingy91, they both come with an iBasis card with uh, 10 megabytes of uh, free data. So moving on to IP transport options, this is chapter six. Um, here we mainly have the two I'm gonna focus on are TCP and uh, UDP. Um, so TCP does have rate, uh, data retransmissions. That uh, can be very useful. Then you know whether your message has arrived. Um, the downside is it is a slow handshake. Um, TCP also has error detection, which can be very useful for applications, but it is not suited for narrowband IoT. Also, um, one of the downsides of TCP is uh, repetition, is that you do use repetitions if uh, data is not received. On the UDP side, there's no handshake needed, uh, which makes it better suited for low power devices. It has a bit less, you know, less data overhead. Um, but on the downsides, you know, you're not guaranteed to have delivery and also not all major cloud vendors do support uh, UDP yet, but this is you know as as time goes on, this is uh, this is starting to change. Um, I think one of the key things to think about on the UDP versus TCP side is you know is destination acknowledgement more important than power consumption? That's one of the key things, right? So if you need destination acknowledgement, might be a good idea to use uh, TCP. If you need, uh, if power consumption is more important, probably a good idea to go with UDP if a cloud vendor supports it. One thing to note with UDP is too, you can always retransmit instead of acknowledging if you wish to do so. So that's also a useful thing. You also have a non-IP data delivery, um, which removes the IP overhead and it is very network optimized. So it's actually even, less power consumption than UDP, but at the moment, not many networks support it. Um, it's only supported on narrowband IoT and not many cloud vendors uh, support it. But this is one, this is one to you know, start looking at. This is one that can be very interesting uh, in the future. So some of the key things to think about here is, you know, is ultra low power and data cost a high priority in your design? then UDP uh, transport protocol and also UDP uh, UDP uh, based uh, application protocols may be more useful to look at. And also, do you know which IP protocol your cloud service supports? 
and also which application protocol your, uh, your cloud service supports. Moving on to security. So we do have uh, TLS is for TCP, DTLS for UDP on the transport layer in the modem firmware. So adding TLS or DTLS does increase the data overhead. Of course, you're, you're adding security, but it, you do get more overhead. Instead of TLS, uh, DTLS, you can also use data authentication via a pre-shared key. Um, that does have less overhead than TLS or DTLS. So that uh, that can be a good uh, sort of middle pathway to use um, if if you want to both have security and um, yeah have less uh, overhead than TLS DTLS. We do also have support for Trusted Firmware M, which implements the platform security architecture. Um, so this is actually available in a lot of the samples in the NRF Connect SDK. That's the SDK that's used for the NRF 9160 system and package. Um, we have also have support for ARM Trust Zone for data security. Um, so that essentially sets you know secure and non-secure regions of the flash, uh, RAM, and peripherals, and then you put the put the the important things in the secure side, so the keys, etc. And then you boot over to the non-secure side um, for the application. We also have ARM Trust Zone uh, CryptoCell, which is essentially hardware accelerated cryptography, uh, true random number generation. Um, and yeah, other features. On the photo side, so the firmware over the air updates, we do have, it's a good idea to sign firmware images before, well, it's recommended to sign firmware images before going to production. Um, the link there does go to the relevant documentation, which talks more about that. And Foda is supported uh, in NRF Cloud too, so you can actually easily, you know, test this out, test out Foda yourself on NRF Cloud. Um, some considerations to make there is that is you know ultra low power and data cost high priority in your design. Um, then you might you know want to use the PSK for example, um, the pre shared keys. Um, and, you know, will you store keys on your device? I want to look at, let's say, ARM Trust Zone, for example. Okay, moving on to uh, chapter 12 now. We have the antenna design recommendations. On the antenna design, it is very important to start the antenna design as soon as possible. Um, otherwise, it may be very costly when you go uh, to certify. And this is especially the case if you use both uh, LT and GNSS. So if you have, you know, two separate, one LT antenna and one GNSS antenna, for example, that, uh, yeah, in general, just super important to start as early as you can. Um, we do have a white paper. That's white paper. 33. You can either click on the link or you can go to Info Center uh, on the left hand side, check out white papers and then find the 33. More information there on antenna and RF interface guidelines. We do have also have hardware files, so that's both layout and, and uh, bill of materials. I believe we provide uh, Gerber files there for both the NRF9160 DK and the Thingy91. So we've actually had some customers that essentially just use the Thingy91 design uh, as much as they can and then create their own PCB and yeah, they use that to go to market. That's uh, of course, you know, make sure, check, check out the licensing and stuff when you download the hardware files on the website links here, but it should be possible, you know, to essentially, yeah. I mean, you use use the hardware files as a guideline for your own designs. That is, uh, that's important. And we do also have, you know, design partners. Uh, that's both uh, Tau, Glass, and Ignian on the antenna design uh, side. 
Uh, I can actually quickly go through that. Um, but before I do that, I just want to mention one more thing quickly. So I, I have actually had, I've confirmed this one myself with a Tao Glass representative that one of the most sure ways that you're going to spend more money during certification is to wait until the last moment to do antenna design. Um, so, you know, if you decide to use one of these partners, inform them early on about what you plan to do and they can help you, you know, create a, uh, create an optimized antenna for, uh, for your application. Um, we also have Tower Glass and Ignean uh, webinars, which we've done on these two links here. So that can be useful to look at. So if I go quickly to the design partners, you can actually just go to nordicsemi.com and Nordic Partner Program. So if we open that up, you can actually see here uh, the design partners. It's just taking a bit of time to load. There, okay. So design partners are essentially companies that are part of the Nordic Partner Program and they're qualified, you know, to help in uh, design related uh, things. So this can be anything from, you know, hardware RF design, software development, advanced RF antenna design, but also security uh, design and implementation. Uh, more information here. And here we can actually see a list of all of the different uh, design partners. So if we, let's say we go to here, you can see Ignion or Ignion. You can open this one. We also have Tau Glass here. So both of these, if you click on those links, you can see a bit more information on what they, what kind of services uh, they offer. Yeah, and it's the same for Tau Glass. Great. Um, we also have, you know, solution partners here. And here you can, you know, read more about that. So they, again, they have joined the Nordic Partner Program and they, they basically provide solutions. Um, again, that could be anything from pre-production services, uh, protocols, some kind of software, prototyping platforms. Uh, many different solutions that they offer to uh, Nordic uh, customers. So moving on to some uh, key takeaways, please, you know, read the Nordic white paper. So the 044 thoroughly. Um, I'll actually have, I can actually show it quickly to you. So if you just go to info center, nordicsemi.com and then you go to white papers and then it's this one best practices for cellular IoT development so like i said i have gone through a lot of the chapters half of the chapters but there is more information if you want to learn a bit more about you know uh what did i not cloud services if you want to learn more about certifications nordic partners etc a lot of good information here um, and, and even for me that has worked with cellular IoT for quite a while, um, this white paper has, you know, connected a lot of the dots. It has made things a lot clearer, uh, some things that I have not really understood fully. So wh whether you're, you know, just getting started with cellular development or whether you're, you know, a senior, uh, cellular engineer, whether you have a lot of experience. Uh, it is worth uh, a read through. Like I said, the data value versus the data cost is very important. So when you can, you know, only turn on the radio when you really need to, um, you know, send the immediate data immediately, but data that you can defer either, you know, send it in bulk, like I showed from that chart um, to minimize the amount of data you send, either do some kind of local processing or use some kind of machine learning AI um, software. So Edge Impulse, for example. Um, in essence, it's, I mean, it's easier said than done, but plan well 
and it will lead to less issues later on. So that's everything from that basically encompasses all of it, right? Where you want to, where you want to um, deploy your product, what kind of SIM card you want to use, SIM, uh, so a local SIM versus a roaming SIM, uh, hardware design, especially antenna design, you have on the software side, you know, what protocols you want to use, application protocols, uh, transport protocols, etc. the amount of security you want to use. These are all considerations to take into account. And again, I'm going to highlight it again. The antenna design is very, very important because, yeah, if you, you, you can have a very ultra low power SIP like the NRF 9160, but if you have a bad antenna, I can guarantee you that you will not get the optimum performance out of the NRF 9160 system and package. And last but not least, use the Nordic Dev Zone. I, I've already mentioned this. I'll mention it again. Um, we do have, you know, 50 engineers roughly working there full time manning the portal. Um, you can ask, you can check out the forums, you can check out the blog posts, the guides. Um, you can ask public questions, you can ask uh, private questions. Um, yeah, they're very helpful and they know what they're talking about. Here's the Nordic Partner Program, just a bit more on that. Um, the idea here is, you know, to simplify cellular as much as we can um, by having partners that have experience with cellular development. So anything from hardware design uh, to antenna design, uh, connectivity, uh, cloud and device management. So AV Systems, for example, has a very good uh, uh, device management uh, um, device management uh, feature. So device manage device management implementation. And AV Systems also does support the cellular location services. So the uh, location services on uh, provided by NRF Cloud. We also have uh, some other partners here. Um, we have Memfault for remote debugging, uh, fleet monitoring, and over the air updates too. For machine learning, I already mentioned Edge Impulse. And for location services, we have uh, NRF Cloud. Um, so these are NRF Cloud, we basically have uh, both cell-based and uh, GPS-based uh, location services. So the idea being that you're able to get accurate positioning while uh, minimizing the power consumption as much as possible. So we have a single cell, we have multi-cell, uh, we also have assisted GPS and uh, predictive uh, GPS. But again, more information on nrfcloud.com on that, or also on our website, just go to products uh, and then cloud services and you can read more there. If you wanna learn more about the chapters that I've not discussed, please check out the best practices guide for cellular IoT development. I've already shown you how to get there. You can either click on the link or just go to infocenter.nordicsemi.com to download the white paper. Last but not least, if you want to sign up for more webinars, go to webinars.nordicsemi.com. Um, if you need tech support, you want to join our community, go to devzone.nordicsemi.com. And if you want to find out more about our products and services, you can do that at nordicsemi.com. So yeah, without further ado, uh, let's move on to the Q&A.